Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, as Jane pointed out, um, I am coming from the perspective of a philosopher. So I appreciate all of you uh, showing up for, for this talk. I know this is probably a little different from what you might expect in this form. So I hope I can make this uh, worth your time and uh, interesting. Uh, I hope to do three things in the talk. Um, first, I wanna give a sense of how values can relate to science. I think there's a general recognition that, you know, this is a significant issue when we're dealing with these policy relevant areas of science where there is a lot of impact on society. So I'd like to explore how this can play out in a little bit of detail. And then I wanna make this somewhat concrete by looking at three um, specific examples of how values can relate to science. And then uh, as Jane pointed out, uh, when I give these kinds of talks to the scientific community, you know, transparency is typically brought up as one of the key ways of handling this. And I agree, and I've been writing about this, but I think there are some interesting questions that we can explore to um, sort of delve a little deeper into how transparency can be most effective. So let me first turn to sort of thinking about how values can relate to our science. And just to start, I think it's helpful to um, just get clear on some of the different things we could mean when we talk about values in relation to science. Um, you know, sometimes we might be thinking about sort of broad worldviews that we bring to our science, maybe a concern about the environment or enthusiasm for, for capitalism. Um, we might also be thinking about particular ethical principles that inform our science and policy, um, trying to minimize harm to people or um, trying to act in accordance with the precautionary principle. Um, also, I think that um, we often have social values in mind, say a concern for public health or a concern for economic growth. And as I'm gonna be noting, I think that's especially relevant when we're talking about these issues related to toxicology and, and so on. Um, but then we could also think at a more personal level of the values that scientists bring to their work in terms of their career goals or you know, preferred hypotheses that, um, that they're uh, fond of or wanting to, to, to push forward. Um, and then there are large scale scientific paradigms and you know, disciplinary orientations that um, might affect scientific practice and then one might think of as a kind of value. So I wanna note, um, I would rather not get too into policing terms and say, well, some of these things count as values and others don't. Um, we can talk more about this in the Q&A, but I'm just interested in how, if we take the, the range of these considerations here and suggest that they're, they're relatively non-empirical compared to um, you know, other factors, um, let's think about how this range of factors can relate to scientific practice. So with that in mind, this is kind of a central model that I find helpful for thinking of how these different values or, or relatively non-empirical considerations could uh, affect practice. And so at the center, I point out that, you know, the scientists are um, having to make a range of judgments or unforced choices in science. So cases where the empirical evidence doesn't force their hand, it leaves room for judgment. So sometimes this may involve how inquiry is framed or the specific questions that get asked about a topic or the study designs that are used for um, exploring a particular question, um, how the phenomena in a particular domain are modeled. Um, and of course, you know, all the choices that go into interpreting the available evidence and then standards of evidence, you know, how much evidence is demanded in order to draw a conclusion. And then when information is communicated, what categories are used, uh, what terminology, and so on. And so I think of values as sometimes, you know, sort of motivating particular judgments, um, or um, they might not even be consciously motivating, but they could just unconsciously affect how scientists make these judgments. Um, but then also these judgments end up affecting values. So I mean, obviously when thinking about these issues of assessing uh, potentially harmful chemicals, um, you may have ambiguous evidence. And if you interpret it one way um, and conclude that a chemical is harmful, that's gonna be more protective of public health, that's gonna support those values. If you interpret it another way and conclude that the chemical is not harmful, that's gonna perhaps be more supportive of particular economic values. And so even if values aren't acting in a causal role, just 
uh, when scientists are making these unforced choices, they clearly have consequences for values that we care about. So this is kind of the picture that I think might be fruitful for us to think about in the rest of my talk. Um, and I said that I wasn't going to police terms, but I did just want to clarify, often when we discuss these issues, um, the, the language of biases comes up. And I would like to suggest you're welcome to challenge me in the Q&A or we could explore this a little bit more. Um, but I find it helpful to keep these as somewhat distinct where I think values can act as biases. But when I think of a bias, I think of some standard and the idea that there's a systematic deviation from it. Um, whereas with values, we're talking about something that's desirable or worthy of pursuit, if we think about all those examples I gave on my previous slide. And so I think that while, um, you know, as I said, values can act as biases, there are also lots of cases where um, they could influence how we frame an inquiry or what questions we ask or, or how we go about our modeling. And I'm not sure if those always count as deviating from some standard. And so I think it's helpful to keep these somewhat distinct in our minds. Okay, so with that background, let me get a little bit more concrete um, uh, and, um, and look at in scientific practice in some of these areas that you all may be working in, how we can think about these um, judgments um, that could be influenced by values or affect values. And I really like this paper um, published by uh, Fern Wixson and Brian Wynn. Um, they were reflecting on some debates um, in the European Union about um, testing of genetically modified crops. And they were pointing out all these judgments that go into the design of studies when you're doing um, toxicology. Um, so you have to make judgments about what hypotheses to test, the test materials, the comparators, the endpoints of interest, the time frame, and so on, as I've put in bold here from this quotation. And what I would note at the end of their quotation, they know that these choices that, that I'm calling judgments affect the development of scientific knowledge, but they also affect the appraisal of theories for policy. And so the point there is the point I was making at the end of my figure, where depending on how you make these choices, this affects values that we care about, as I was saying before, perhaps causing you to conclude that something is harmful or not harmful based on these judgments. Another example that I think will be salient to a lot of you are these judgments in interpretation where you have, say, regulatory guideline studies with particular um, results, and then you've got peer-reviewed academic studies with particular results, and sometimes they don't mesh, and one has to decide how do you weigh these different kinds of studies. And you know, this was particularly brought home to me about 10 years ago um, in discussions about BPA that you know most of you are probably very familiar with, um, where you know you had the regulatory guideline studies suggesting it might not be so much of a problem, and the academic studies suggesting it was. And um, of course, this led to the Clarity BPA study that we're going to get to hear from, from Professor Vandenberg in a little bit. And while I'm talking about Professor Vandenberg's work, um, I promise I didn't put a slide in here just because we get to hear from her in the next presentation. I've, I've used this before, but I think she really nicely brings up some of the key judgments at play in debates about BPA. And one of them that I think is a really nice point is this question of what constitutes an adverse effect. So, you know, this gets into the interpretation of these results. Do you need to see overt signs of toxicity in order to conclude that something is an adverse effect? Or are there these other kinds of um, phenomena, developmental disruptions or so on? And so this is a perfect example of these judgments that I don't think the evidence completely forces you to adopt one interpretation or another, but one has to make this choice and it can affect values that we care about. And you might be influenced by values consciously or unconsciously in how you approach this. Okay, so now let me turn to some examples of a slightly different sort of these judgments um, involving standards of evidence. And here I'm building on the work of another um, philosopher of science, Heather Douglas. Um, and in some articles and in this book of hers, um, 
she says a lot of our scientific disputes boil down to disagreements about standards of evidence, how much evidence to demand in order to draw a conclusion. So, you know, how many studies do you want to see before you're willing to say, yes, there's an effect here? And, and what kinds of studies? So this overlaps a little bit with my point earlier about, you know, um, the regulatory guideline studies or academic studies, but even studies with particular study designs and so on. And um, you know, what kinds of statistical significance levels does one want to see in order to draw a conclusion? And so just to give an example, um, here turning to an example maybe outside of toxicology, just to give a, a bigger picture. Um, when Jim Hansen, the famous climate scientist, appeared before the US Congress in the late 1980s. Um, he famously testified that he thought that uh, we now had enough evidence at that point to conclude that um, global warming was actually happening. You know, the scientists had been saying, based on their models, they predicted that it would happen, but he said he thought it actually, we could now say it was happening. And some of the other climate scientists, like I have this quotation from Alan Robach, um, were a little bit nervous about this. They said, you know, we're not sure that we have enough evidence to draw this conclusion. And so it's really worrisome that Hansen is going before Congress and saying this. And so I would point out, though, um, at the bottom, Hansen was very thoughtful about this and was pretty explicit about the value considerations that I was mentioning earlier in the talk, that he says he weighed the costs of being wrong versus the costs of not talking. So he thought, what are going to be the effects on things we care about of me drawing this conclusion or not drawing the conclusion? And he thought that it was justifiable, given those considerations, to say, yeah, the evidence is pretty strong here. This appears to be happening. So um, he's very much thinking along these lines about how much evidence is appropriate to demand before drawing a conclusion. And then another example that's perhaps closer to home and that ties in really nicely with our uh, talk that we just had about IARC is um, thinking about whether glyphosate um, uh, is a carcinogen. And I found this article to be very helpful to me as a non-specialist in understanding some of the reasons why IARC and EFSA seem to be um, you know, drawing different conclusions. And a lot of it seemed to come down to these issues of standards of evidence. So in this article, um, it points out that case control studies uh, weren't regarded as adequately reliable by EFSA, but IARC you know, was thinking that they were providing an adequate source of evidence or a reliable indication of an association. And in terms of statistical significance, um, EFSA thought that statistical significance was necessary in order to draw a conclusion, whereas IARC was concluding that you know, if you saw a significant positive trend for some tumors, that was sufficient evidence. So, of course, I know there are many people in the audience who could say much more thoughtful things about this, but my point is just that at least um, in these two examples, it seems like you do have this issue of, you know, how much and what kinds of evidence are needed in order to draw a conclusion. So we see these, these judgments. And then finally, my last example, um, sort of a way in which, you know, these judgments play into scientific practice. Um, Hugh Lacey is another philosopher of science, and he says um, that the framing of problems are really significant to consider. And um, this is almost like an overarching judgment that can then affect how one makes many of these other judgments. Um, and so an example that he really focuses a lot of his work on is agricultural research. And he points out that, you know, you might think in terms of, you know, there are other questions that one might think about for framing research, but he sort of, you know, highlights these two. You could, he says a lot of research seems to be framed uh, thinking about how can we develop crops that are going to have the greatest output. But he notes that you could ask a, a somewhat different kind of question one that's posed by um, this ISTAD report that it's meant to be a little bit like an IPCC kind of report for agriculture. And um, there they say, you know, maybe we should be trying to use agriculture to reduce hunger and poverty, you know, to improve rural livelihoods and to promote a kind of a rich conception of sustainable development. And Lacey's point is that, 
depending on which question you use for framing your research, this may affect a lot of aspects of your work. It could encourage different study designs, um, perhaps different standards of evidence and different interpretations of ambiguous evidence. If you go back to the glyphosate um, example, you might think if you're focusing on getting the greatest output out of crops, um, you might be more sympathetic toward glyphosate and um, more likely to uh, conclude it's not a problem than if you're focusing on rural livelihoods where you may not think it's as valuable or essential um, that other approaches to agriculture might be more valuable, um, you might um, operate a little differently in uh, response to ambiguous evidence. So oh, um, we could talk more about um, these things, but let me turn then to the question of how do we respond to this? So say we acknowledge, yes, policy relevant science is permeated with these kinds of judgments where the evidence doesn't always force our hand. Um, how can we act responsibly? And um, I've suggested, I published this book a few years ago, and I tried to explore a lot of these kinds of examples of uh, values relating to science through these judgments. And I suggested three rules of thumb, if you will, for responding to this. Um, one is, I think that um, those engaged in doing science um, can try to make choices that are as responsible as possible. They may want to consider, you know, what are the social consequences of, you know, approaching these judgments one way or another, very much like Jim Hansen did in response to climate change. But I think we'd all acknowledge that there's a lot of uh, disagreement about what the most responsible choices are. Some people would say, um, yeah, you've got to really focus on prioritizing public health. And others would say, yeah, but when you make particular judgments, you don't want to go too far. Um, and so there can be these conflicts. And so um, a second approach is to have engagement among interested and affected parties to kind of negotiate the best ways of handling these judgments. And I know that's something that the uh, Food Packaging Forum is you know, trying to help uh, accomplish. But even with that, there are still going to be some who disagree with how uh, uh, the conclusions of these kinds of efforts. And so that's where transparency becomes really important so that we can be clear about what are the judgments being made and why um, and, uh, and so on. And so uh, just to be clear about how this transparency can help, this is probably fairly obvious, but it lets others um, make their own decisions about how to respond to these um, uh, value-laid judgments. You might decide, you know, based on how these judgments were made, um, this scientific research really isn't going to serve my interests because I would have wanted to approach these judgments differently. Um, you might say, you know, this, this work can be useful for some purposes, it's good enough for some things, but it's not going to be useful for other purposes because of the judgments that were made. And um, another really valuable aspect of transparency, of course, is that in some cases, you might be able to reinterpret the science. You might be able to, um, you know, if you have access to the underlying data, you can analyze it differently in, you know, alternative ways. Uh, of course, sometimes, if the judgments have affected how the study was designed, um, it may have been designed in a way that it's not going to serve your purposes. So that's why I note that, you know, this depends. Um, and I do want to anticipate a potential objection. Somebody might say, you know, is this turning into kind of a free for all where we all just interpret the science based on our own preferred values and anything goes? And that's not what I'm saying here. I would note that I'm focusing on unforced choices, these cases where the evidence leaves ambiguity. Um, so if somebody said, you know, I really want to draw the conclusion that the earth is flat, um, I think one would have to point out to them that they're just aren't plausible judgments that could be made to draw that conclusion, that based on the, the, the available data, you just would have to torture it in order to draw the conclusion that the earth is flat. So I'm, again, focusing on these choices where there is this um, ambiguity. But I would note, I think some of the most um, significant debates and conflicts arise when people can't decide whether the evidence is actually ambiguous or whether it's pretty straightforward. So the cases where the conflicts are dramatic is when one side says, really, 
Um, it's not appropriate to interpret the evidence in another way. And the other side says, well, we think there is actually ambiguity here. So that becomes a significant issue. Um, so what I'd like to, to do in the final part of my talk as a philosopher is to get us thinking a little bit more about the complexity of trying to be transparent, if that is you know, our goal. And um, so I want to suggest that the pursuit of transparency involves difficult choices about how best to communicate about these judgments I've been talking about. So just a, a simple figure, um, we've got these first order judgments about how to do science, how to interpret the evidence, um, you know, how to design studies. And then we've got these second order judgments about how appropriately to be transparent about those first order judgments. And I wrote a paper about this, um, this that appeared this summer where I talked about what I called seven dimensions, if you will, of transparency. So I said, we have to make decisions about what our goal is, what's our purpose for being transparent. And then based on that, that's gonna affect who the audience is that we're trying to reach with this transparency. And I think different audiences actually care about somewhat different content that we need to keep in mind. And then um, different actors um, and different venues are going to be more appropriate for communicating different kinds of content. And then as we think about all these issues, we have to think about dangers of transparency. Sometimes putting a bunch of information out can cause confusion or the information can be misinterpreted. At the very least, it involves time and money and effort. So we have to make all these choices in our efforts to be transparent. And um, so just to flesh this out a little bit, um, I'd like to suggest some questions for us to be considering. So one is, you know, who's the audience for this information, um, say about these value-laden judgments? Are we trying to communicate to other scientists or are we trying to communicate in particular cases to policymakers or to the broader public? Um, or even to specific communities within the public, like particular patient groups, if we're dealing with medical information or um, environmental hazards that may be relevant to fence line communities exposed to particular hazards or advocacy groups that are interested. And so in a commentary I wrote last summer with um, David Resnick in Environmental Health Perspectives, we suggested that the open science movement, which is you know, designed to help with this transparency, um, we said it's great, but it tends to be more focused so far on um, avenues for openness that are relevant to other scientists. Um, that you know, even open access publications, most members of the public can't you know, make a lot of sense of. And so uh, we encouraged in that commentary that we need to think about mechanisms for open science that, that reach a range of stakeholders, including just you know, average members of the public. Um, and so um, then as we think about these audiences, we need to think about what's the content that they care about here. Um, so in order for them to appreciate these judgments, do they want open access to the study data? That may be what a lot of other scientists would, would benefit from. Um, do they want kind of a technical discussion of the key interpretive choices or study limitations? Um, again, other scientists would probably like this, some sophisticated policymakers perhaps. But a lot of audiences would just like a really basic clarification of these key judgments, um, the str basic strengths or weaknesses of studies that are being produced. Um, some of them might say, look, we just want a basic indication of the potential values that could have influenced the study. Like, we just want to know the funding source or something like that. Um, and so, um, um, I just an example of how we can think about different ways of getting this information to these audiences. I suggested that, you know, for the general public, the science journalism can be really valuable here when it's done well as a way of advancing the open science movement by clarifying some of these key judgments in a basic way or giving indication of these potential values at play. So we need to think not just the work of the scientists themselves in being transparent, but these other kinds of institutions like um, journalists. And so this leads me to my last question, who's in the best position to provide this sort 
sort of transparency. I just suggested that journalism um, may be a source. But I think if we're thinking about different communities, not just the public as a whole, but even particular groups like those who may be particularly risk averse and concerned about certain environmental issues or particular advocacy groups or, or patient groups. I think we need to think about a network of different actors and organizations that can take information about these judgments that go into science, these values, um, and um, explore the issues that are relevant to particular groups and, and clarify them in a way that can make sense to particular groups. And so um, I actually, as I was working on this, I thought this is really connects well with the work of the Food Packaging Forum, because I take this, the, that this is a large part of what this organization is trying to do. And so one of the questions moving forward, I think, might be, for the different stakeholders that the food packaging forum is trying to reach, um, are there differences in the ways that information needs to be communicated in order to be helpful for them? You know, what level of detail do they need, and um, what level of clarification do particular stakeholders need? But I think this is something that you know we can all be thinking about. Um, those of you in your scientific work, what are the best avenues for? clarifying these issues for different um, stakeholder communities. So I think I'll stop there. Um, I've got this final slide that just kind of give an overview of what I aim to talk about, but um, maybe if I stop here, there's time for a question or two before our break. <laughs>